Welcome to Speak of the Devils, the premier podcast for Sun Devil Football. I'm Brad Denny with 3TV. And I'm Joe Healy with DevilsDigest.com. All right, Joe, we are here, settled in and still in the, the new digs, getting a feel for the uh, stu- uh, studio here at 3TV CBS 5. We are kicking off, I can't even believe this, year or season 13 of Speak of the Devils. Our, the show is about to turn 12 years old here in a couple of days, our next month, and then 13th season. That It's mind-boggling this is wild stuff man like if a baby was born on the first day that we did this show it would be about 12 years old <laughs> and that would be someone that's like a real human being like you know what like I'm saying? sixth grader or something something like that right i mean this is <laughs> wild i don't i mean we didn't really you know have a design for the future when we got this thing started in 2011 but i don't know if we were thinking 12 13 years you know well in advance of a, of a decade with this new technology coming in in season 13 so we're fired up about it uh yeah we haven't really had ourselves a real full show we had a great time of course speaking with rashada family that was awesome if you haven't checked that out do that and maybe not right now but after you <laughs> listen to or watch this show uh but we really haven't gathered together to talk about sun devil football sun devil sports brother there's a lot to talk about and not even just focusing on the fact that we're not that far away from fall camp there's a lot going on in sun devil universe right now there absolutely is. And so we got a lot to talk about today. And then uh, you mentioned, you know, we kind of this is the unofficial start of our 13th season because we're going to look ahead and start looking at this 2023 season in earnest and in detail. We're going to be ranking our top 10 most important non quarterback Sun Devil players uh, as we do every year. And so we're going to count down from 10 to 1 the guys that we think are going to be the most crucial to determine this level of success this upcoming year. The recruiting trail. I mean, this used to be kind of a slow time of year, Joe, but not anymore. I saw a, a fact today that, uh, you know, a lot of these classes, you know, over the last couple of years, that, like teams across the country are now putting together between June 1st and July 4th, a h- huge section of their uh, signing classes. So this is a very active recruiting period. ASU's landed five brand new verbal commits for the 2024 class since we last joined you. Uh, you're going to hear from one of those guys a little bit later on, Plas Johnson, a local guy from Chaparral High School. And also ASU, as we talked about in our last episode, picked up a blue chip commitment for the 2025 class from quarterback Michael Butter Tollefson. He's going to be joining us a little bit later on, talk about why he chose uh, the Sun Devils as the place to continue his college career. The MLB draft was uh, just conducted, and a lot of Sun Devils got to hear their name, Joe. So we're going to dive in, into that as well. So much to discuss, but... I think perhaps even beyond just the 13th season premiere, so to speak, another piece of big show related news that's coming up. Folks, if you're in the Valley, keep Friday, August 4th open on your calendar. If you're not in the Valley, get in the Valley. I don't care if you're on a different continent. I don't care if you're on a different planet. Get on back to earth. Come on to Tempe, Arizona, the graduate hotel in Tempe. Awesome spot. Here's what's going to be happening that day. 6 p.m. Friday, August the 4th. Brad and I, we're taking this show on the road. We're doing Speak of the Devils live at the Graduate Hotel. It is going to be an incredible time. We are going to arrange some incredible guests that y'all are going to love. We're going to be there. We've been working with the great folks on that location. There are going to be some drink specials. There's going to be food. It's an awesome setup. I'd actually never been there before we took a quick look at it. It's a really cool place down there, kind of by Gamage uh, Auditorium there uh, around uh, Apache, kind of near Mill Avenue. So it's an awesome, awesome spot. We're going to have a heck of a time. We're going to be doing our show, like I said, live in front of hopefully all of you. Come (laughs) one, come all. Free admission, free parking. That's a real big deal if you're in Tempe, Arizona. We're going to have an excellent time. We're going to be talking a lot about it as time goes on, but we'd love for you all to join us. It's going to be a blast to kick off this 2023 season of Sun Devil Football. Yeah, it's going to be our first time out there in front of a live audience, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. And then after the show's over, you're going to be sticking around a post-show Sun Devil Summit. Those things always uh, definitely. It has been a over. while. Like when was I? I mean, it's been a couple of years at least. It, it's interesting, yeah. So we have to go like, is the official thing when Jedi's in town or whatever? But oh, also that's then. A factor. Yeah, so I there's was a lot around of around the time Gus was here for his performance last year, or when the '96 team was here a year before that, or yeah. their Legends Luncheon. So, uh, you know, if y'all know the Sun Devil Summits, they're a very good time. We've done several of those. <laughs> there was a period of time where that was undefeated 
And it's always undefeated in all our hearts. Yeah. So it's going to remain whatever <laughs> and oh for the duration of eternity. But yeah, we're, we're going to turn up a little bit, have a really good time. I, it's just been too long. You know, we, like I said, we used to do those events very regularly, at least once a football season, maybe even sometimes multiple times a year, depending on th- how things are rolling. So we're really excited to, to see you all out there. Again, we're going to be sharing a lot of information about that. We're going to have swag we're going to give away. Free stuff. Everybody who shows up is going to walk away with some Speak of the Devil's swag. Might have some other goodies for you as well. It's going to be an awesome time. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about the season. We're putting together our guest list, the VIP list. We're getting that sorted out. So there might be some secrets that will be disclosed over time. Maybe day of the show as well. We might just keep it completely hidden from y'all. I don't know. We're going to be a little mysterious here. But like I said, over and over again, come out, hang out with us. We'd love and truly appreciate your support. At the end of the day, it's going to be a blast. When all these Sun Devils get together for this good cause, it's a time to remember. Absolutely. So, yeah, August 4th, 6 p.m., Graduate Hotel, Tempe, Arizona. Make sure you stick with us on the social media side of things. Uh, We'll get those handles out to you later. But, yeah, definitely a lot of cool stuff coming in. You know, uh, just another tease. That's like one of two major announcements that we have coming for you here pretty soon. So stay locked in. All right, so let's dive into Sun Devil Sports. Uh, As you mentioned, Joe, a lot to talk about. Uh, so talking first a little bit about baseball before we dedicate the rest of the show to football, the MLB draft was just wrapped up uh, today with the later rounds of the draft. A lot of Sun Devils got their names called as to be expected. You know, this is MLB U for a reason. I believe it's what Alec Marsh was the 116th, 117th former devil to make a, his Sounds debut. like a good number to me. Yeah, it's Alec, a lot. My man Alec Marsh got in there for Kansas City not too long ago. Yeah, and so, yeah, the Royals are also got some sort of a love a little bit later on. But running down the eight Sun Devils that got their names called during the draft, uh, second baseman Luke Kieschel got his, it was the first Sun Devil off the board, went pretty early, 49th overall in the second round to the Minnesota Twins. But no, the Twins were not done because they picked up uh, pitcher Ross Dunn in the 10th round, 297th overall. Uh, the run of pitchers continued in the 11th round. The Pirates took Christian Curtis, 347th. It's the San Francisco Giants took Timmy Manning, so take good care of him. Jack Loader with the 360th pick. Pitcher Josh Hansel went in the 16th round to the Royals, 469th overall. Uh, Blake Pivroff went uh, 560th to the Detroit Tigers. Can join like some torque. Him, not, not to interrupt, I apologize. I like how they had him listed as a third base. It's like if you're drafted by ASU, you got to be listed as a third baseman because when <laughs> Torque was picked first overall, they had him technically slotted as a <laughs> third baseman. It's like – that was kind of weird because that threw off the possibility of like a superlative of a college first baseman being one uh, one overall. But <laughs> I digress. It's just a weird little oddity. Yeah, definitely. And so then uh, we actually went back to uh, to a hitter, Wyatt Crenshaw, who had some good moments this past season. He went in the 19th round, and you know he's staying home, folks. He's a Valley kid. He is picked by the Diamondbacks with the 565th overall pick. Owen Stevenson, the pitcher, rounded out the proceedings. 573rd pick in the 19th round went to. Tampa Bay, so good class there. A lot of quality guys. Hopefully they have great success at the next level and continue to add to that 116, 117, whatever number that is. Uh, continues to rack up a little bit. But, Joe, there were some other notable draftees and other some other, other guys kind of, you know, the outside of that group that, uh, you know, are looking to move on to the major league level. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, if we're talking about ASU signing class uh, for, you know, the 2023 year, obviously for the 2024 season, uh, as far as the high school signees are concerned, Ralphie Velasquez from Huntington beach, that guy's a, a prime time elite recruit. It's one of those guys that you, you commit, you know, you sign, but there really is never any expectation that these guys make it to campus. He was picked 23rd overall by Cleveland. To my knowledge, no other high school signees were were picked the, as far as uh, from the ones that uh, that are pledged to ASU. It's challenging to find all the information about these recruits. It's just it's not quite as easy as logging on to the old rivals.com and seeing your basketball commits, your football commits. Sometimes it's a little challenge. So, you know, I was wondering as far as just personnel and who might be gone from last year's lineup who might uh, never make it to campus, that sort of thing. Uh, The list there is pretty limited as far as uh, the 2023 signees. There were some old faces for medium, I can't say longtime Sun Devil fans because these guys you have only played college ball a few years. But those of you who've been paying attention to ASU baseball for a few years might remember some names like Hunter Haas and Jack Moss that that, uh, played last year at Texas A&M, began their career as Sun Devils. They were both drafted, as was Graham Osman who is now at Long Beach State, Brian Calmer. He went and made his way to Gonzaga. He was drafted as well. Uh, Cam McGee, 
younger brother of our guy, Brandon McGee, the entire McGee family. Uh, it's awesome, awesome people, Cam included. Uh, he played this past year at Washington State after transferring from ASU. He was selected as well. So, you know, you've got a list of names, whether it's ones that came straight from Arizona State, ones that might have spent some time in Tempe, or ones that had intended to, quite a few who were picked in the MLB draft. Uh, and you got some superlatives here, Brett. It, it's an interesting thing because the draft is kind of, you know, different than it was in the past, like pre-COVID. You got your 20 rounds now. For maybe casual fan, fans, 20 might seem like a ridiculous amount, especially if you compare that to, you know, NBA or uh, NFL, something like that. But that's actually way fewer than there used yeah. to be. So, you know, there used to be 40, 50. Like, you look at some of these things from the old days. I think, you know, you have picks that are li literally thrown away. You know, they're they're selecting. Michael Vick got picked one year, select, like the 40th round or something. Yeah, and I mean, even this year, I don't think Ungalele, like, is he, when was the last time he played? High school. Yeah, so you have guys even now that they're taking <laughs> suppliers on. Uh, but some interesting superlatives about this. You know, ASU with eight selections, that's a big deal. It, I saw a number, and if I think we can call it valid because it favors ASU, so why not? Uh, that I believe ASU tied for the fourth most uh, selections of any college program up there with the likes of LSU, had a pretty good year last year. Pretty good. Stanford, also a pretty good year, and some others. So that's a big, big deal. As far as ASU standards, ASU history is concerned, so this is this overall amount of draftees ties for the most in the first 20 rounds since 1985 for ASU. I mean, think about that. Really good teams under Pat Murphy. Really good teams under Brock. Didn't have that many players selected in the first 20 rounds of an MLB draft. Uh, six pitchers in the top 20 rounds. According to my research, that's the most ever for ASU. Really interesting thing when you consider the fact that <laughs> pitching has not necessarily been the strong suit of this program for a rough couple, couple of years. years. So you have some players, especially, you know, a guy like a Josh Ansel, you know, someone that had high pro upside and it's paying off with the, you know, draft selection there. Uh, now, if you want to kind of, Narrow it down a little bit. Folks might be saying, okay, 20 rounds, that's that's a lot of opportunity. Okay, let's narrow it down a little bit. ASU had four players drafted in the first 12 rounds. That ties for the second most since 2008 when six were taken in the first 12 rounds of that particular draft. Obviously, that was a really, really good time for ASU baseball, you know, in the very late stages of uh, Pat Murphy's tenure here. So however you want to slice it up, this was a really good draft for Arizona State. And so that's something that, again, you can say things like, oh, guys were taken in the very late rounds. Or, well, if you had a ton of pitchers that were taken and, you know, perhaps the pitching was not at the highest tier as far as the college game is concerned here in Tempe, what you can say positively is that's a good look for ASU. It's a real good look for Willie Bloomquist. That's something that you can recruit to, especially when you look at the list, see how many of these guys were transfers. Transfer portal obviously is going to be a huge deal in baseball as it is in every sport. Again, this is a win across the board for me, something you can really promote as far as, you know, emphasizing what your program can do as far as getting guys to the next level. So hopefully the uh, success in the MLB draft can parlay itself into some postseason appearances and success as this program under Willie Bloomquist continues to build up. But, you know, some good numbers there. I mean, this is a ASU has long been the pipeline to get to the major leagues. A lot of devils are out there. So it'd be interesting to see how many of uh, these guys making in this 2023 class are able to make their debut and make their mark at the majors here. So hopefully they continue on an upward trend. It's kind of just, you know, one of the first phases. Got some pro talent. We got Now we got to start stacking some wins and, and get into the postseason appearances and back to that Sun Devil standard. I know Sun Devil baseball fans are really eager to see. And now and on that same general topic, I know that the question remains, a lot of these players who were drafted still have college eligibility left. So the question becomes, okay, are they going to sign contracts and start their professional careers? Or are they going to possibly come back, play at Arizona State? I mean, you, you never know because everybody values different things. Some people just want to move on with their careers. Some people make, you know, very good um, financial arrangements. Obviously, you got a guy like a Luke Kieschel coming to the second round. He's played his one year at Arizona State. Absolute best of luck to him. That guy's not coming back. <laughs> uh, others may. It is very rare. I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe I did the research last year more in relation to Ethan Long being, I believe, the very last pick in the draft. Mr. Irrelevant, yeah. yeah. Uh, about how frequent or infrequent is it that, <clears throat> that Sun Devils who are drafted come back if they have eligibility. I was only able to find a couple occasions uh, in the last maybe 10 plus years or so, and that still includes players that were drafted in the 20, 30 plus round, you know, 
area of the draft. So remains to be seen. It would be wonderful if some of these guys came back, especially the arms, to continue to try to improve the pitching quality of the program. If not, obviously all the best to them. All right, so now turning our attention to football. Uh, some news before we dive in to the recruits that ASU or the verbals that ASU was able to get oh, since we last joined you. On a related topic, though, because as we've seen, we've talked about at, at length, from last year to this year, Kenny Dillingham and staff have overhauled this roster. I mean, you're pushing uh, 50 newcomers on this roster in terms of just the high school, junior college signees, transfer portal additions. They were able to do that because the initial counter cap that had been previously in, in place for a long time was waived. Obviously, there's a lot of you know new era of college football coming off the COVID. A lot of this roster management is been uh, very difficult, very challenging, very intricate. But this the initial counter. Uh, wave has been crucial for the Sun Devils and along other, other schools. You, know, you look at Colorado, other schools that are bringing in more than just the, the typical 25 newcomers that, you know, for years schools could be limited to. Uh, you know, of course, ASU had that, that huge number in influx, was able to do in one year what probably might have taken two, three, maybe even four years in terms of uh, working within that prior 25 uh, player cap. The waving the the uh, wave of that initial counter has been extended. So more good news for ASU and schools around the country, so they can exceed the 25 newcomers in future years. Uh, obviously, in the, the transfer portal era, Joe, this is like a necessity because obviously you're gonna you want to have that lifeblood of just getting players into the, the prep ranks, but you need especially a rebuilding team that is on try, is aiming to be on the way up like ASU to get those guys that come in from the transfer portal, whether they have one, two, or multiple years left to come in and, and make their mark and, and build that program rather than just having to have a more deliberate process, especially in an age where coaches have such shorter leashes than they ever have before. Yeah. I mean, obviously this news is crucial to me. It's like a no brainer. Uh, yeah. It, between all of the factors, the transfer portal, people entering the draft eligibility, you know, the folks just finishing their careers, the number 25 just seems so minuscule. You know, <laughs> if you think that like, if, if you couldn't exceed that, but with, what I just mentioned, I mean, you're going to be losing a lot more than 25 players per year. So, I mean, you're operating at a deficit if you're expected only to limit it to no more than 25 players. So, again, that's a no-brainer kind of thing. Uh, I think they should just do away with it. I mean, I, well, I mean, what's the argument against it? That like a, a an Alabama or a Georgia or USC is just is going to bring in, you know, 40 guys that are all top guys? I mean, yeah, that's a possibility, but also these guys – are going to be intelligent and say, okay, I'm not going to be the third quarterback to sign with them this year as right. a high school recruit or something like that. I mean, they, they see the writing on the wall. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the, what the danger is, the harm is, what the risk is in just having that counter deal, not even be a thing. Yeah. I mean, I think in this transfer portal NIL era, I think, you know, water eventually will find its level. It's starting to, I, I, I mean, I think there's a way to go, but I think that, you know, you were starting to see things kind of mediate a little bit in terms of just, you know, finding, you know, kind of the more ebb and flow and we'll see what kind of you know upcoming legislation in different states or with the future of the ncaa if they're going to ever gonna get off their ass and do anything we'll see but i think you know things are starting to slowly glacially maybe you know kind of find find uh, their rhythm so we'll see but i think that this is in this transfer portal era has got to be is a necessity i mean teams need to be able to rebuild and i think it engages more fan bases as well because if you have a path to be better quicker or less awful quicker than that you know, that might help uh, engage more uh, more teams across the country but as part of that you know obviously you're going to be bringing in a lot of high school kids as ASU has been very active on the recruiting show we mentioned off the top that you know the relatively historically a slow part of the year the ASU has been pretty good at getting some verbals obviously the dynamic duo of Brian Carrington and Rashad Samples has been a big part of that since we last joined you on our last episode, five new commitments bringing ASU's 2024 class total to 16. And that's 39th as of this recording in the rivals recruiting rankings. Pretty good. Still a ways to go. And there will be some movement as we talk, as uh, we kind of close out this part. We'll, we'll get to a little bit, but running down these five guys in kind of the order of the commitments. And you notice the, kind of a, a trend in these five, just the defensive backfield is being addressed. Uh, cornerback Rodney Bimaj, a three-star out of Dickinson, Texas. And again, more Texas guys because he got that Carrington and uh, Rashad Samples. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, I got a North yeah, Texas, shirt Texas shirt on. Texas shirt on. Texas forever. Hey, yeah, I, there you go. How about it? 
yeah, d- yeah. Like I, this we is, did not plan this. You do the show long enough, thirteen years, you start to like dress like I guess. Uh, so, Bamaj is obviously a very talented guy. He, he took an official visit to Kansas. Had some other prominent Power Five offers as well. Six foot, one hundred seventy five pounder. Uh, then that was followed shortly thereafter by the, as we mentioned, the guy you hear from a little bit later at the end of the show, Plas Johnson, uh, an athlete technically, but it looks like he'll, at ASU he'll start off at defensive back, even though he is a very accomplished receiver, over a thousand yards for Chaparral a season ago. Another high three star prospect, six foot one, 165 pounder, uh, cho- chose ASU over uh, BYU and Kansas State. So it's another local commitment, Kenny Dillingham himself, a Chaparral alum. So they got that connection there. The uh, the lone offensive uh, commitment. During this span was tight end Jaden Fortier, a, a three-star prospect, six foot five, two hundred fifteen pounder from Oregon, and I think you'd like to see a, your tight ends be have a basketball background because this guy can hoop, great athleticism, and perhaps the thing that might most endear him initially to Sun Devil fans chose the Devils over the University of Arizona. One thing I noticed on that level, which made me smile, is looked at is I you know I don't really I don't follow recruits until they you know make their decision you know what i'm saying <laughs> and i saw his instagram you know after he had made this incredibly wise choice and then at first you know he had pictures or videos or reels or what have you of you know different recruiting visits that's cool that's normal stuff he had one of his visit to the u of a and then i noticed shortly after he committed he had removed that from his instagram account now he had others i think like washington maybe you know other ones that's fine but there was one that was there before, not long after that was erased from existence. He knows. So he gets it. So that was, you know what? He's he's batting a thousand in my book. What was that that, that wildcat? It was Kadeem Carey? Was that he the, the the picture that would kind of circulate around territorial cup game week of him like on his ASU visit and like the ASU garb? Yeah, yeah. He was wearing a, an ASU jersey for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> this is a different story, but I remember at that time there were a lot of folks that thought he was going to go to ASU. So, yeah. That didn't happen, but AC did all right. All right. So rounding out the five commitments was uh, linebacker Martel Hughes, another three-star, six foot two, hundred ninety-five pounder, out of San Diego. And then uh, pro- one of the guys that really has gotten this class really are the this coaching staff really fired up about his commitment. Cornerback Chris Johnson, second, a high three-star and a four-star, I believe, on twenty-four-seven, six foot one, hundred seventy-five pounder from Texas, of course, uh, the son of former NFL cornerback Chris Johnson, who had, I believe, a decade-long career. Played for the Ravens amongst other teams, but a quality player in his own right. So it runs in the family. Uh, made his announcement, and that was a, a big. I think I think it's the, one of the Fourth of July commitments that uh, he, he made, had the the uh, Instagram live. So that was a guy that I, I know, like you know, Brian Carrington told him that he was number one on his board. A cornerback that has got a lot of the, a lot of folks in that Sunnyvale building really excited. Yeah, and you know, a lot to break down about these guys. And you're talking about recruiting rankings, things like that. Obviously very subjective. It varies from site to site. And, you know, I got to stick with the home team, home rivals, things like that. But uh, a few of these recruits and, and also others that are already on the commit list are like that 5.7, you know, they put that numerical value and that's like right on the fringe of being a four star. So as the season progresses, it's possible that some of these could be bumped up or down, but you know, ASU has a few guys that, you know, you get them up to that four-star caliber, and that makes the, the class as a whole. The difference between three and four, at least as far as optics are concerned and the casual fan base is concerned, that's a pretty big deal. You know, a lot of us will break it down a little bit, uh, you know, more molecularly as far as, okay, who are the guys that are offering them? Where are they from? Et cetera, right. et cetera, what schools do they play for? That sort of thing. Uh, but you got guys from San Diego, from Texas, from Oregon. Because, yeah, I believe that, the you know, the tight end, there's at least one outlet that has them as the top player in the state of Oregon. I'm not mistaken, not at his position overall. So, you know, as long as you can keep keep these guys coming here, you always have levels of concern if, okay, if an organ goes after him or if, you know, somebody from, if USC goes after a guy from San Diego, if UT, whatever. Again, I'm not taking the negative attitude here to it, but uh, it's been a big stretch of time. That's a, that's a big, big deal. This staff is really putting something special together in that regard because you got to look at recruiting as just a larger pie than what we're, used to and i just hope i don't understand why it hasn't been the case and i hope something would change with you know the recruiting websites have it be the entire class of acquisition because the high school and junior college recruits that is not all that a you know incoming class of new players is for any program include the transfers get off my soapbox about that but yeah this crop looking good yeah and it might not and there might be a 
another addition coming up here pretty soon because on July 15th, a, a three-star linebacker from the 2024 class, Sire Gaines of California, is uh, going to make his college choice. ASU is in his top six. Things are trending pretty well in that direction. So could be another addition to that Sun Devil defense uh, with Sire Gaines on there. So as we mentioned, as it currently stands, 16 verbal commits, 39th in the uh, rivals rankings. And as Joe alluded to, these all these guys got another season of ball coming up at the prep ranks. So they put some good seasons together, show some more stuff. So you could see some movement on those rankings, get some more. So as of right now, Dylan Tapley and, and uh, Tony Lewis and, and Cuba are the two four-star quote-unquote blue chips uh, of this class so far. But you could have a couple more because this is a staff that is putting in the work and has the recruiting chops. Yeah, and we're not even factoring in this season of football for ASU coming up. Obviously, we're talking about, you know, for the high school recruits and that sort of thing. If ASU is able to make some advancements on the field and show that their product is matching, you know, the hype or the way that I'm sure that the coaches are hyping it to recruits, that that adds up. I mean, we've seen it quite a bit where the first season of a head coach at ASU, we've seen quite a bit of success. There's actually kind of an interesting trend of the past handful of head coaches where they have year one success. Some didn't really do much after that, but hey, there are some that uh, you know use that as a bit of a, a launching pad. So if ASU can show it on the field, that just helps more and more, and that would probably resonate uh, no greater than the local recruits because there are some top-tier guys that are committed to some top-tier schools, and if you want any chance of maybe swaying them to be that hometown hero, you got to get it done on the field. So we'll see how things progress in the coming months. So the things are heating up on the 2024 recruiting trail, but – Right now, let's maybe hop in the DeLorean a little bit, head into the future as uh, we talk with ASU 2025 four-star quarterback commit, Michael Butter Tollefson. All right, let's start off with the big question. Why was Arizona State the right place for you to commit? Ooh, I mean, a number of reasons, but, you know, some of the big reasons were relationships, just, you know, my relationship with Coach, Coach Baldwin, Coach Kenny Dillingham, it, it meant a lot. And then the fitness system, you know, I feel I really feel like the way that I play the game really fit, fits the way that Coach Dillingham wants to play the game. And then another one, just the love that they showed me. You know, they made me they made me feel they made me know that I was their number one guy. And uh, when they show show love to me, I show love to them. So I'm fully locked in, and a whole bunch of reasons, but those are the main ones. So quarterbacks often are, are commit earlier in the cycle, perhaps other positions. But you know, being the 2025 guy, why was now the right time? You know, I've been getting recruited for, you know, a couple of years, a year or two now. And, you know, in the process, there's a lot of fake love. There's a lot of love and a lot of fake love with it. I mean, I just feel like this process, this whole recruiting thing, it's a lot. And I kind of wanted to get it, get it off my plate, be able to focus on football. And also just, you know, I had a great feeling about Arizona State. I knew it was the place I wanted to be, just the relationship I had with Coach Dillingham and you know, why make, why wait it out? Why make it longer when you know where you want to be and just get it off your plate? Ken, Kenny Dillingham's had, had a, obviously a great track record of developing quarterbacks throughout his uh, still young career. Uh, but, you know, when you look at, at the quarterbacks that have learned and played for Kenny over the, his various stops, you know, what kind of things jump out about his track record as a developer of the position? I mean, a ton of things. You know, when Jordan Travis first went to FSU, you know, from Louisville, no one really thought of him as a, as a quarterback. They thought maybe, you know, he should switch positions. But now look at him now, about to be a Heisman contender. You know, Coach Dillingham really got the most most out of him that he could. Uh, and then Bo Nix, again, he was at Auburn. You know, he was highly recruited, but he didn't really do a lot at Auburn. Went to Oregon. People were like, ah, what's going to happen with uh, Coach, Coach Dillingham over there? And then you saw just a crazy year, massive numbers, Heisman contender last year. Going to be, you know, just what he did with Bo Nix and Jordan Travis. Um just speaks a lot of what he can do with an offense and he's going to do it again at Arizona state. He's had success everywhere he's gone. And I just, he's going to have success again. Now you've obviously visited Tempe, got to up close look at the program at, at, at Tempe at the school. You know, what, what things really kind of jumped out to you most when you got to see them in person during your visit? Oh, just the culture there. Like it was great. Even compared to some other spots, you know, not to talk that, but it was a great culture. I talked to a lot of the kids, a lot of the players came up and talked to me, you know, some players were telling me how like, just, you know, a lot. Of, there's a lot of transfers on the team, and they just said, like, transferring there, being there with the staff, 
not just Coach Dillingham, but the position coaches, just everyone around the facility, how it was really just the best decision of their life and how they're getting the most out of them. You know, the team's putting in the work, and they're going to they're gonna switch that whole thing around, making a winning culture and win games. That's the big goal. Now, you obviously have one of the best nicknames out there uh, that I've seen in, in a long time. Walk our listeners through the origin of the Butter nickname. Oh, it's no crazy story. It's just from my mom. I was shoot, a little tiny baby, and she, she started calling me Butter, and it's it stuck with me my whole entire life. But uh, everywhere, my teachers, my coaches, you know, just everyone I talk to, I'm Butter now. <laughs> Good deal. You know, you, you know, kind of staying back in, in, the, in the past a little bit, how did you first get into football and ultimately find your way to the quarterback position? I mean, shoot, I've been on a – I learned to walk, walk on a football field. My dad's been a football coach his whole entire life. So really just, you know, while he's coaching, I was walking on the football field, growing up on the football field. I started playing when tackle football when I was, shoot, five years old. So, I mean, I played other sports. You know, I played football, basketball, baseball, ran track. I did a lot. But just football's always been my love. It's always just been, like, my whole family – Football's our thing. Now, you mentioned playing football when you're just a, a toddler, basically. Do you remember your first touchdown pass in the game? Ooh, my first touchdown pass? I don't remember my first touchdown pass. I think I remember my first touchdown run. I definitely remember my first touchdown run. What, walk our listeners through. What, what, was, do you, what do you remember? What, what's the play like? What was the play call? Ooh, it was like, it was like I was probably like six playing eight U, and it was just like a halfback toss from like the 20, <laughs> and I just ran in. I, I'm pretty sure that was my first one that, that I remember. <laughs> What's been your What's your favorite part of playing quarterback? You know, the most important position on that field, and just a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. What's what, What's really kind of sticks out? Why you love that position so much? Oh yeah, I mean it's the uh, it's not the main position on the field, but you know it's the one most talked about. It's probably like the biggest one, highest pain, and it's just like being a competitor. Like at quarterback, you compete. Like every decision you make, when you run, when you pass, you impact the game every every single play. So it's just it's just that competitor in, competitor in me wanting to go out there and just beat beat the the opponent and just I've been playing I've played every position but quarterback I started at quarterback and then around like in middle school I was like dad I want to go back to quarterback so I mean we've been grinding since sixth seventh grade at quarterback just trying to be the best we can be. For any of the listeners out there who have not seen your seen your senior tape or seen you in person play. Give our get those folks a self scouting report. What are the skill sets that you bring onto the field? Self scouting report. Well, I'm not just like a pro style quarterback. I can kind of move on my feet too. I feel like I can make every throw around, and then I feel like I can improvise when need be. I'm a football player at heart, so you know if the puck is breaking down or I need to, I need to make something happen. I feel like that's a strength that I have just from playing football and watching a whole bunch of film, making things happen. I just I feel like I'm a I'm a straight out football player. And obviously, you have a lot of tools in, in your uh, in your skill set. You know, be able to throw and to run as well. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that just kind of the offense that Kenny Dillingham and Bo Baldwin have uh, really is, is attractive. What are some of the things that, from a quarterback's perspective, that really jumps out about their scheme and what they'd like to do schematically? You know, everything that they do, it's it's based off the defense. You know, they're just going to take exactly what the defense gives them. You know, when you're in the in that QB meeting. There's a lot of responsibility on the quarterback. Quarterbacks can make a lot of calls, but it's nothing too complicated. Everything that you call is just it's reactionary off what the defense does. And then, you know, Coach Coach Dillingham likes to pass the ball, so they're going to light it up through the air and take what they give them on the ground and light it up on the ground too. A lot of, you know, with the quarterback that t- typically commits earlier in the cycle, you know, a lot of times you see those guys try to rally other uh, other recruits out there, kind of join them at their destination. Is that something that you see kind of yourself over the over the next you know, year plus of just kind of rally some other folks to join you in ASU's 2025 class? Oh yeah, I've talked to a whole bunch of people. Um, I've talked to a whole bunch of receivers, some a couple of defense defensive players. You know, the big guys. I've talked to Cooper Perry. Uh, Raiden Vinesbright and then Dejon Hayden, those are all players from the, the Phoenix area that uh, Coach Dillingham made sure that we're trying to go get those guys. So I've been talking to them, trying to get them on board and uh, talk to a few players on defense too. So definitely, that's definitely a big thing for me. you got a couple of years left at the high school level before you don that maroon and gold. What are some of the things that you're looking to kind of elevate your game and show out there on the high school fields over the next couple of years before you get ready for college? Oh, man, I transferred this year. I transferred over to J. Sarah Catholic. So, you know, we played the best competition in the country, one of the hardest schedules. We play, you know, top top 100 ranked teams like six times this year. And I just want to show 
I just want to show people that I can go out there and, and be a winner. Just win big games, be a competitor, and uh, you know, shock some shock some people with the games that we win. And looking at your future, you know, a couple of years down the road when you're in that maroon and gold and you're running out of Tillman Tunnel and Sun Devil Stadium, what are some of the things that kind of excite you the most, just generally, about getting the chance to play major college football? Oh, uh, you know, it's always been a dream of mine. Just the energy, just the competitiveness, that's always a big thing with me. And I mean, I've been, since I was four or five years old, I've been watching all the college football hype, hype videos. You know, I just, I've just really lived my life to be out there on that field. So it's going to be big for me. I'm, I'm going to be excited. All right, great stuff from ASU's future quarterback. But now, Joe, let's turn our attention this fall. The reason that this is the season 13 premiere, typically we start off with a rundown of the players that we figure are most crucial to the success of these upcoming year. And as we did have done for most of the last several years, quarterbacks out of it. Because, I mean, obviously the quarterback position is so crucial in the, in the game. You know, you know, putting Trent Borgay on, on there and you know, his play is probably going to be self-explanatory so let's kind of you know get that aside and kind of get really into the, into the weeds a little bit and take our deep dive because there's a lot of talent on this team there's a lot of question marks a lot of inexperienced guys so and a lot of opportunity because you know while the national media i i, I I've, it seems like three and nine is like the national refrain yeah like to just they, they think that i don't know it's just kind of defaulting to a copy and paste basically yeah like, but i mean sorry that kenny's not as flashy as coach prime or whatnot but there's going to, nevertheless, I think that there's a lot of talent here, but that's obviously no guarantee for success. So we're going to run down our individual list. We have not shared our respective one through tens. It's not a mutual thing. It's not an agreed upon thing. It's not a democracy where we're <laughs> voting or anything like that. And one thing to keep in mind for those of you listening and watching is this is not a top 10 list of the best players. This right. is not that sort of thing now obviously there's a correlation there but this is like the most important guys this is the guys that like if this dude or these dudes on the list if they go down if they underperform whatever the case may be that has a drastic impact on this team as a whole the season as a whole and that's of course why we exclude quarterback because if you take it in that context that's going to be number one on your list every single year so this allows us to create a little bit of suspense and variety in what we do yeah and so you know one of the things and what i compiling this year's list especially was like areas of dire need and if you've been a listener of the show you know what what uh, i think are the big areas there and so you might see a lot of guys top of that list and so before we dive into our counting reverse counting down from 10 to 1 uh, some guys that just missed the cut for me i'm gonna start off with aaron, right tackle aaron frost uh you know, obviously offensive line remains huge huge question mark uh, this guy was a multi-time all mountain west performer uh, on his resume. However, he also has a lot of injury time on his resume. Uh, he has missed all of last season with injuries, but ha had some other injuries in career. Missed all of spring ball, uh, unfortunately, for ASU uh, due to injury, but the expectation is he should be back. He's a very talented player. I think you know he can be able to lock down that right side, uh, and I think it's, the, the expectation is that he needs to be because we saw after him, Emmett Bowley got some reps a, a season ago, but a guy with the mul all, mul or all Mountain West uh, on his resume, pretty good, pretty good. A lot of he looks the part. So, but you know, I just don't have him at this point rising to the one of the top ten lists. But I think the offensive line is you'll hear on my list very important. Uh, kicker Dario Longhetto is another guy. Obviously, you're replacing all three specialists. I think this is going to be you know a season where you can have some close games and you're going to be needed to have a kicker that you can count on. It's a reunion with former uh, Cal offense or special teams coordinator Charlie Regal is now a at ASU. So. Longhetto's had some good success. He had, I had a really strong spring, showed off a really good leg as well. Uh, so if he's going to be locked in as ASU's kicker. You need those points. ASU's had some ups and some downs recently in, in the kicking department. Uh, and for me, the, another position that's kind of just missed the cut is that safety. I have kind of like two guys that right in the kind of neck and neck, Shamari Simmons and Xavier Alford. Uh, obviously, Simmons was the guy that was an FCS transfer uh, coming from Austin P. Alford is a guy that is went uh, started his career at Texas, most recently at USC. Both I thought were really good in spring. Simmons especially. This guy was a. I mean, doesn't like isn't the biggest safety. Isn't necessarily a Chris Edmonds type of body, but he hits hard. This is a guy who just really unloads on ball carriers. Also has a nose for the ball. Alford, his athleticism, his his ball his uh, ball skills are very evident as well. Um, I, but the reason I don't have them quite there yet, even though this is going to be a four-two-five defense, we're going to have a lot, you know, three safeties on the field, a lot of the time. 
I think there's just a lot of quality depth. You have Edmonds coming back, Montana Warren, Jordan Clark has experience there as well. So there's going to be some other pieces there that I just, uh, that at this point, I am just on the outside looking in. So I'll generally agree with that list with one exception that I won't disclose yet <laughs> because that person is on my top 10. But the others, I'll agree there. I'll throw out a few others just for the sake of it. Uh, Xavier Guillory, he was really on the fringe for me. Um, I just think there's a lot of there's some expected talent at that position. Um, so that's one again, just doesn't crack right in the top 10 for me. And I'll say linebackers because there are a few ways that it could look. Uh, you know, you've got a couple transfers, you got a guy like Will Schaefer who's got a good amount of experience, some starring experience, but not a ton of it. Of course, losing Merlin Robertson, Kyle Soley, that's going to affect your defense. So that's why I wanted to select a linebacker, but I couldn't necessarily pick a particular one. So with my honorable mentions to me, I can just lump in that whole group of like top tier linebacker possibilities. All right. So here we go. Let's count it down. Starting off from the bottom, working our way up to the most crucial of all the Sun Devils. Joe, who's your number 10? My number 10, safety Chris Edmonds. So he's ASU's leading returning tackler. He had 50 tackles last year, led the team with three interceptions, showed some promise uh, among, you know, obviously what was a dreary season for ASU, especially defensively, came up from the FCS level. So you figure one season under his belt, that was a good one. This is someone that could really catapult to like an all-conference caliber, you know, performance this season. You mentioned that you've got some talent, some newcomers at the at the safety positions in the secondary. Obviously, a different look as far as the defensive, you know, alignment is concerned. So there are some variables there where he's someone that 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 I think needs to step up and be a leader in that secondary among those safety positions so they can help usher in some of those newcomers, even though those guys have college experience or some, you know, highly uh, uh, regarded recruits, that sort of thing. This is a season for me that I think that he can transition again. Very good season last year. Can transition into something very special again. If you flip it around, and if he is hurt, if he underperforms, that takes to me a lot of quality away from that secondary. I'm going to stay in the secondary with my pick for number ten in the cornerback row, Torrance. I know that Cole Topham, multi-time guest on the show, is the president of his fan club, and for good reason. He was a really good cornerback in the Pac-12 a year ago. Unfortunately, missed three games, and I thought his presence was missed in those games that he uh, was out. But he's a guy that was really just had showed a knack for the ball. I mean, he's a six foot three, six foot four cornerback, great ball skills, and I think he's really kind of taken that next step up after transferring over from Auburn. A guy that uh, I think has true lockdown number one cornerback potential, and I think the secondary right now is going to need that number one type of guy. And I think that Torrance has all the skills there because. Uh, a lot of new pieces in that secondary. You mentioned the uh, safety spots as well, but also a lot of talent at cornerback as well. You're returning Ed Woods, Mason uh, Mason Williams as well, Isaiah Johnson's back in that mix. A lot of younger guys that could be potentially factors in there as well. But I do think that through it all, you need an elite that likes to throw the ball around. You look at some of the teams on ASU's schedule that you're going to need a guy that can be able to kind of take that number one receiver off the chessboard. And I think at Roe Torrance with his physicality, what we saw from him in spring, his fit in this new defense, and just everything seemed to come together for this guy to have a monster all-conference caliber year. Just got to stay healthy, get out there, and be that lockdown guy, take away a side of the field. A theme that you heard from in my number 10 pick, uh, the theme through the remainder of my picks, you're going to see like leadership experience being a high value. I think that's a big, big deal when you have a lot of roster turnover, when you have a new coaching staff, obviously a first-year head coach. Uh, so number nine for me is a guy that's uh, got 30 games under his belt at ASU. That's defensive line and Anthony Cooper. Uh, had a little cup of coffee in the transfer portal, right, but made his way back to ASU. There's no, you know, no harm, no foul type situation. Uh, we've talked a lot about the defensive line and how there is – going to be some concern until we see what goes on on the field. Obviously, that was a problem area last year. So uh, remains to be seen what we get out of Michael Matus as he's coming back from injury, uh, a lot of new pieces. So Anthony Cooper on the field, he can perform for sure. We've seen some highlights out of him, and I think that, that his veteran presence, stability, reliability, those sort of things are going to be huge as well. So again, that's why he's in my top 10 because that's someone in, in a team like this, a season like this, situations like this, you need your experienced veteran players to step up in leadership roles on and off the field, and that's something I'm counting on him doing. I'm also going to take a defensive leader on the side on the uh, for my number nine pick, but it's also it's weirdly a newcomer, not a guy that's been around for a number of years. 
like Anthony Cooper, although it's not the last time you hear Cooper's name uh, in this segment. Linebacker Trey Brown. Uh, obviously, ASU lost a lot of their linebackers from a year ago, and, and Kyle Soley, Merlin Roberts, and Connor Soley. But that kind of doesn't matter. That defensive scheme, not great. In comes the 425 of defensive coordinator Brian Ward. AJ Cooper coming along with Ward from Wazoo to coach the linebackers. So this 425 scheme puts a lot on the linebackers. And you have Brown is a guy who's a veteran of many years in the Pac-12. He knows this defense inside and out. He's also a pretty good player. I mean, he's he wasn't a full-time starter, but has starting experience with the Cougs and has made some plays. And he looked really good in spring. And not only just did he look good on the field, leading that linebacker group on, on the defensive side, he was also helping them on the field because he knows his defense. And I'm talking to guys like Will Schaefer, Tate Romney, Crew Jackson, they all talked about how Brown was a, a valuable resource to learn this new defensive scheme because this is a defense that's going to unload and unleash the aggression on the opposing offense. Some of them are completely absent last year. So this is going to be defense that gets after it, and it's going to be not just kind of the vanilla scheme we saw a year ago. It's going to be a lot of complicated stuff, and a lot's put on those two linebackers that are going to be in that middle of the defense. And a guy like Brown knows the defense inside and out, is a respected leader already in just a, a few months here in Tempe. That's why he's my number nine. So switching from one line to the other, offensive line, We've had some questions over the you know last <laughs> several months, and obviously we know, as it is pretty much every year, but uh, extra important this year for the offensive line to be healthy, to be stable, to give ASU's offense a chance to operate. If that's not the case, then then there'll be some dark days. Uh, so the first but not last offensive lineman that'll be on my list, number eight for me is Leif uh, Faltanu, coming in from UNLV. Ben Scott transferred, of course, uh, to Nebraska, occupied an interior line position that Faltanu is expected to fill as well. This guy has experience. He's had some all-conference caliber accolades. He's someone that needs to come in, especially at that center position, and be a stalwart on the offensive line. You know, you look at these projected starting offensive linemen, including him, and these are guys that, that, I mean, goodness, like they got to stay healthy. They got to perform. You know, you, you you need to have that close knit group for the season. Last year, obviously, there were some injuries that were dealt with, other matters. Uh, so, so him coming into the program, obviously, it's the first year at ASU. This will be my first, uh, only three options. First newcomer that I'm going to be listing here on the top 10 list. But he's someone that, again, talent-wise, accomplishment-wise, could have an all-conference caliber season or could be up there, you know, with some of the better interior linemen in the conference and ASU is really going to need that again, as they uh, operate this new offense from Kenny Dillingham and Bo Baldwin and all these skilled position players that ASU has, and, and they do have some to brag about. That's only going to go as far as the offensive line goes. My number eight is the exact same. Yes. Fatanu. Uh, he looked really good in spring. I mean, but a lot's going to be counted on this offensive line. This is an offense that schematically is pretty impressive. And it's kind of the quarterback is, is the point guard of this offense a lot in most every play he's got to get that ball out of it within two and a half seconds a lot of stuff are going to the short game uh, he was there's always gonna be a hot read on a play but you need an offensive line that can hold fast open some lanes in the run game but also keep a quarterback upright and i think we have a lot of questions about whether this offensive line it can do that because there are i mean there's talent there but there's also newcomers guys coming off of injuries uh, some guys that need to kind of step up their game. But Fatanu has been a really good, a solid presence in the Mountain West for a number of years. You mentioned Joe, an all-conference player. Uh, but you have questions at both in the guard spots. You, know, you have some newcomers that might come in and be able to fill those spots. Or, you know, Joey Ramos coming off a season any injury. He locked down the right guard spot in spring. But you just wonder, you know, guy who missed a complete uh, total year. And even then, early in his career, was just kind of a spot starter, a swing guy at Iowa State. So there's some questions. But you have a guy in Fatano who at the Mountain West level was really good. And be, if he can be the anchor of that interior of the offensive line, I think that can be a, a big step forward for the Sun Devil offense that you, you don't need to, to hold your blocks forever because, again, a lot of these passing concepts, balls out in two, two and a half seconds. So, But just be good enough because you have a lot of weapons and it would be a damn shame for the Sun Devils to not be able to kind of get to reach that potential uh, just because their offensive line uh, struggled mightily. And I think if Matano can take, come in and build upon what he did in spring, lock down that center uh, position for the Sun Devils, good things might happen for this offense. So my number seven is going to be a guy that Brad mentioned uh, just a moment ago, Roe Torrance. Uh, all of the potential in the world showed quite a bit of flash last year. Again, this is a season that that I expect him to take a major, major leap talent-wise. Um uh, 
you look across this conference, you've got a lot of good quarterbacks. You've got the Heisman Trophy winner. You've got some others, ones that transferred in, ones that are returning. Um, we still don't know what ASU is going to bring as far as pass rush, though I know they're going to put a lot of effort into it, a heck of a lot more than we saw last year. That's for sure. Uh, but until that sort of material is put together, really puts an emphasis on a guy like Roe Torrance in the secondary to be able to do whatever it takes to shut down that top receiver for the other teams. Because, again, there are some good ones across the conference. So that's going to be you know a big, big deal. This guy's got massive NFL potential, could be after this season. Uh, so, again, he's someone that I look at, like we talked about, a lot of new pieces in the secondary, some intriguing talent when you guys – when you have guys that are returning to the program from the previous year, uh, again, that's something that they can build on what they've already done here, provide some leadership and a guy that has all the talent in the world, great frame, like far surpassing what the typical frame is for a cornerback expecting a big year out of him and ASU is going to need it. All right. Number seven on my list is going to be going back to kind of the need base. Cause we, I have serious questions on for ASU on both lines. I uh, talked about the offensive line last, Right now, we're going to the interior of the defensive line. Defensive tackle, I think, is going to be a big uh, determining factor in terms of whether this defense is able to play up to potential. If ASU is able to make a run at a bowl, they had a lot of defections in the middle of, of that defensive line. They did make some additions, uh, missed out on a few guys that they were really hoping to bring in uh, through the transfer portal. But one guy that they did secure, I think, is going to play a major role, and that's Deshaun Mallory. He uh, played 27 games for Michigan State, so he has experience in the big 10 uh but the, you know 44 tackles five tackles for loss over the course of his career six foot uh six foot three 280 pounds has some ability to play some versus some defensive end slide outside he's about 280 pounds but I, I think he really needs to be able to help anchor that middle of the defensive line that's a huge need for the sun devils we saw what happened last year just get they got run over and i think this defensive scheme from you know just schematically is going to be have an improvement but you also need the dudes in there, in the trenches, to be able to have that physicality to not get run over for you know 200 yards against the Wildcats, uh, you know, uh, as we saw a year ago. I think that you know another guy on my list that will be coming up here could really uh, help and team with Mallory to help solidify the, the middle of that defensive line. It's going to be a major area that, of focus for me, and I think for the for, you know fans. If this team is going to make that run for a bowl, if it's going to be a successful first year under Kenny Dillingham, one of those things that needs to happen is they got to be a lot better than they were on the interior of the defensive line. And I think that uh, Mallory has the ability, but we'll see if he's got to do it. I mean, a lot's going to be falling on his uh, his broad shoulders. Moving on to number six. Now, if we were just uh, breaking down a list of the most talented players on the roster this guy would probably be number one or two but he plays at a position group that has improved at least on paper dramatically uh, over the course of this past off season so we're talking about elijah badger here number six this is a guy that made a big leap last year big time leap it's it almost feels like a, a very distant memory when we were kind of you know gritting our teeth wondering like all right is this guy gonna pan out you know he came here the 2020 covid season wasn't really playing 2021 was used a fair amount last year really broke out so obviously the next step for him is like a thousand yard season right before he gets off to the nfl um so again having him at six and not higher than that is a compliment to the wide receiver group that could have uh, quite a few pieces of it that are, that could be quite dangerous. But Badgers, your unquestioned wide receiver number one. You know there are a lot of guys that the uh, ASU's quarterbacks can spread the ball out to, but he is going to be that you know that that game breaker. We saw the different ways that he can be used. Uh, just a tremendous athlete with limitless potential. So again, if he if anything compromises his 2023 season, that's going to be a, a huge knock against. ASU's offense as a whole. If he puts in the work, like I said, this is a guy that the next step for him is like a thousand yard season and, and getting into a, you know, a, a really impressive NFL draft slot position. So if your number six ranking for Badger is a real compliment to the wide receiver room, uh, I must be over the moon for the wide receiver because I don't have him on my list. Um, but I do have, also have a wide receiver at number six because I do everything Joe said, I think is spot on. I think Badger is primed to have a massive year. We saw the, the flash, the potential, the big catches um all you season long and i think yeah th th this guy can be a, a thousand 1100 1200 yard type of guy but i think in order for that to happen you need a viable alternative to keep defenses honest on the other side on the out keep those guys 
busy and uh, on the outside and uh, wide receiver Xavier Guillory, the Idaho State transfer, I think can be that guy. Massive, huge uh, showing in spring. And this is a guy who can catch and run, uh, play, be a deep threat, but also a guy who can take uh, the yards after the catch uh, to take those quick passes from this Kenny Dillingham scheme and makes guys miss and then get into that open field. This guy has good size too, good physicality as well. I just think that you definitely need that number two option. I mean, we'll, we'll talk perhaps about, you know, the, what's, what's going on the, in the middle of the field in terms of, of receiving threats. But I think you need to keep opposing defenses honest on the outside of the, of the field. I think Badger's good enough. He's an all-camp, all-conference caliber type of guy. He's going to get his, but if he, if, the, if Guillory can be a guy that on the opposite side of the field can keep defenses honest, then Badger's ceiling just, or just increases, uh, you know, several, several times over. So we're past the halfway point, and it seems like this is where we're getting a little weird with it because uh, my number six wasn't even on Brad's list. My number five I know is not on his list because he already mentioned this guy. You know, a little spoiler alert I was giving you about the one that was on his honorable mentions that was in my list. That dude is at number five. That's Dario Longhetto, ASU's place kicker. This could be a very big deal. Of course, he comes to ASU from Cal. Folks who look at the surface, look at some of the numbers, yeah, you might be a little lukewarm on what this dude can do at this level. Killed it in the spring, from what I told. Looked he looked very good. good. Look looked good. very good. He is yet another disciple of my man, Steve Roush, Dobson Mustang, Arizona State Sun Devil. Great dude. So, you know, if he gets us, he's got the Midas touch, right? So You can't play special a, teams at ASC without the Roush touch. You know. So this is someone, again, pivotal player for what ASU is looking to do this year. Um you do, there's just so many possibilities for his team as a whole, for the offense as a whole. You don't know if it's going to be high scoring. You don't know if it's going to have some difficulty in moving the ball, scoring points. So we have seen over the last, you know, less than 10 years, the significant difference between having a very reliable place kicker and having very erratic place kicking, having kickers where uh, you feel like they could make just about anything in the stadium to, uh, a kicker where anything that's 40 yards or beyond just seems like it's never going to happen. I mean, we've seen some, not, you know, I'm going to call guys out by name, but I can think of a few like individual kicks that I remember seeing in the last couple of seasons. Like, <laughs> why are they even trying this? And it, I'm not saying it was like a 65 yarder or something like that. So, uh, you know, Longhetto, that's going to be just a huge, huge piece because, uh, you know, again, if he doesn't perform, then you don't really have much behind him. Yes, you lost what two kickers to the the transfer portal, right? So uh, this is he's going to be called upon. You would imagine quite a bit, and so if he can be consistent, if he can take a positive effort in the spring, translate that into this season on the field. Again, I'm not necessarily saying or expecting him to be the next Zane Gonzalez and be automatic from you know 55 to 60 yards and things like that. But if he's someone that can give you confidence in his ability to put points on the board and not be a liability, that's going to be a big thing. But that's why he's here on my list, right in the middle of the list, because we still don't know. So that's going to be you know, a big, big deal this fall. Any offense with Kenny Dillingham or Bo Baldwin at the helm is going to throw the ball an awful lot. But they're also going to run. Uh, you just look at the Oregon last year. They had two backs that ran for over 750 yards. And so this is an offense that's going to run the ball a lot as well. The running backs are also going to be a big factor in the passing game. In spring, we saw the running backs catch a ton of balls. But you look at the, what ASU came, returns at running back. Now, we talked a bunch of our shows over the last couple of years about how under Herm, he likes to run one back a lot. I mean, obviously, Rashad White, you know, uh, last year, ex Um, And so, but this seems like it might be a, a, a staff that likes to distribute the workload a little bit more evenly. But you still need a guy to keep defenses on us, a guy that can – uh, be a workhorse for you. And I think that Camp Scadabo is that guy. In spring ball, he was absolutely terrific. If anybody who went to the spring game saw, he was an absolute terror for opposing defenses. A physical runner, just he remind, continues through every practice during spring. He had like at least one or two runs that reminded me of Demario Richard. Just like that bowling ball that just tackling him looks like the most miserable experience you can possibly have. Uh, a massively productive guy at the FCS level last year at Sacramento State. He's a uh, runs very violently, can catch a ball. I've tweeted a bunch of times that I would be stunned if this is a guy who doesn't end up or doesn't end the season with like double digit touchdowns. 
because I think he's going to be a, a prime goal line back. There's talent there. Tevin White showed some flashes in the U of A game a season ago, and he's very talented coming in, you know, former four star recruit. Uh, you have to Carlos Brooks as well. Uh, the Cal transfer, he looked really good in spring, caught a lot of passes. Javen Jacobs moved over from wide receiver to running back, and he can be an elective kind of scat back type. George Hart as well in that room. But I think Scatabo is going to be the guy that a lot of ASU fans are really going to fall in love with in terms of what he's able to do for this offense that is going to run the ball a lot, but also I think he's going to be able to, a big factor in the passing game as well. So moving on, number four, again, like I was talking about with Badger, if this were a list of just the most talented players, this guy would probably be number one without any sort of argument from anybody involved. Um, someone that broke out like crazy at the end of last year. The statistics he put up in the final half of the season last year absolutely through the roof and are as good as anybody at his position, uh, really in the history of ASU <laughs> in terms of uh, what he did productivity-wise over a few game stretch. And of course, it's Jalen Conyers. Uh, really, you know, we talked about how for Elijah Badger, opportunity to step up. Chris Edmonds, an opportunity to step up from, you know, doing very, very good things to, you know, top tier things. Conyers is someone that, I mean, you really can't put any limits on his potential and what he could do this year. It is not out of the realm of possibility that he could set single season records by a tight end at ASU. Those things are attainable, you know, getting it, especially the position he plays and how he plays it. This guy could be a, you know, quote unquote, day one NFL draft pick. This guy could be a first round draft pick. Uh, he really cannot, again, you can't put any clamps on the potential that he has. So he is going to be a huge focal point. Now, obviously, the tight end group as a whole has a few guys they're going to target. And that's probably part of the reason why, not that, you know, number four is a shabby position for him, but I didn't have him like number one or two because there's some talent that surrounds him at his position group and elsewhere on the offense. But, but, but you know, yet again, this is someone that shouldn't shock anybody. Maybe if he leads a team like in receptions, uh, that sort of thing, because if, if he can just take what he did at the end of last year and, and he's a known commodity now, this guy's not going to surprise anybody. But you, you have a full off season of him being the guy, which he is, man, it could be something special. And it needs to be because he's going to be that focal point. So ACU is going to target him a lot so that the performance needs to match the attention that he's going to receive, you know, both from from his team. And again, he's going to be the focal point of just about every defense at ASU plays. So big, big season in store for Jalen Conyers and the Sun Devils are going to need that. All right. Moving on to number four, going back to the trenches on the interior defensive line. And it's a name that uh, Joe mentioned a little bit earlier, Anthony Cooper. He's moving over from defensive end. Now moving inside to three tech. The, we talked about ad nauseum about how important the play and the interior of the defensive line is going to be for the Sun Devil defense as well because they've had some pretty effective edge play during the spring and it looks like they got a good uh, situation out there. If they can lock down the middle and I think Cooper with his veteran presence, his ability and what we saw some flashes from him in spring is able to do you know he has that veteran presence that can help off the field as well. You have Deshaun Mallory of course playing the nose a little bit then you have Tristan Monday, freshman phenom CJ fight in that mix as well but Cooper is going to be a guy that's going to be counted on to be a stalwart on that interior of the defensive line. It's going to be a real crucial uh, position for him. Uh, he's just got to kind of step up. I and mean, this is a time he's been a pretty good player to have, had some moments, but he needs to take that next, st uh, next step up into a difference maker for the Sun Devil defense, or else it could be another se season of pretty shaky times that when you're, when the other team has the ball, but you know, if he's able to kind of step up and re reach his potential, to, 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 his running mate to also uh, at nose to Sean Mallory, I think that can be they have some pretty good intriguing potential, but I think Cooper, especially playing that three tech spot with his ability, his pass rush uh, skills moving over from end. I think it's got a lot, lots going to fall on his plate. So it's going to be time to see if he's ready to eat. Similar type of narrative because talking about the the same general position group, different player. If you look back, you know, since Kenny Dillingham was hired last November, uh, a lot of important acquisitions by way of like high school and junior college signees. Of course, a lot uh, of inbound D1 and FCS transfers are going to be important. But if you look back on all the the talent acquisition, if you want to call it that, that ASU has done over the last uh, gosh six, seven, eight months, uh, one of the biggest ones will be a guy that they got. For, back out of the transfer portal who had thought about leaving Arizona state. And that's BJ green. Someone that has shown an incredible amount of flash ability to get to the quarterback uh, in his first couple seasons at Arizona state. 
And, you know, the things that we were hearing out of spring ball and just the, the talent that he has really give you the impression that he is primed for a major breakout season. And of anybody that uh, is on this roster that's proven they can get to the quarterback, obviously that is a general statistical category that ASU needs to improve dramatically. He's someone that can do that, uh, brings a lot of energy to this team, you know, yet again, uh, a leadership quality that needs to be there. He's someone that, and this happens all the time, of course, with college sports. It's like in the blink of an eye, you remember him as being this true freshman walk-on that was doing some cool things. Like, all right, who in the world is this guy? And now, fast forward a couple of years that have passed very, very quickly, he's one of the elder statesmen on the defensive line. So between his talent and the leadership that, that he needs to bring, very integral player for this entire defense. My number three is a guy Joe just talked about a little bit ago. Jalen Conyers, absolutely ridiculous second half of the 2022 season when, weirdly enough, the offense decided, hey, throw to our super talented tight end and good things will happen. And they really much, they they did. So, yeah, I, I'd almost be stunned at this point if he doesn't break Chris, Cole, Chris Coyle's records uh, for, you know, single season tight end production. I think, though, you know, those are some things that are well within Conyers' reach. And we saw the dominance over the last, you know, five, six games last season but being there in, in spring practices and watching all those 15 sessions Conyers took it to a whole nother level every practice there was like a holy f type of moment of what he was able to put forth some some of the catches there was some, there was a, a play in a red zone drill where Ro Torrance was in absolutely perfect coverage but Conyers just kind of like stuck out one hand while being draped and just made it look the most casual thing possible but just like he was just dialed into a whole nother level. So I think that this is a guy that is supremely talented. Obviously, he was a four and four star recruit um, and then transferred over to ASU and put forth the, the tantalizing back half of the year. This is going to be an offense that features a tight end. The Oregon tight ends had over 10 uh, combined touchdown receptions a year ago. We've talked about, I don't know how many years, Joe, have we talked about? This is going to be the year the tight ends back. This is all be of the year. them. Yeah, all of them. This, if it doesn't happen this year, when you have. Jalen Conyers in this offensive scheme, besides Swinson, who looked really good in spring too, Bryce Pierre, I thought took major strides forward and he could be like the dude at the position in 2024 for the Devils. But Conyers obviously is the headliner here. He's going to be a guy that I think is going to be, if he's not an all conference caliber or not only all conference team, something went wrong. Perhaps he got dinged up a little bit, but if he's healthy, he is going to put forth some ridiculous numbers. Uh, and this is something that an offense that needs because you have Badger on uh, one boundary. You have, uh, as I talked about a moment ago, Guillory, if he can do his things out there, you keep those defenses on us and, and, you know, on the outside and you got Conyers and Swinson Pierre running the muck in the middle. That's really hard to defend. So if Conyers can able to just, you know, stay on the field right there, he's going to do good things. It's just a matter of to what degree and can he take that next step to great. So we're into the top two. So the runner up, Silver medalist, whatever you want to call it. So this is, you know, prime elite category. I'm going to give you a real hot take here, Brad. It is important to protect the quarterback in the game of American football. Cite your sources on that. Uh, <laughs> my brain. Uh, to do that, you want your offensive line to do well, to be talented, especially at the offensive tackle positions. I'm not favoring one over the other. I'm just saying that. Quarterback protection, giving the quarterback enough time to operate, though, as you've mentioned, you know, this is going to be a fast paced offense. They're not going to be hanging around in the pocket doing their taxes all day long. Uh, but the offensive line, like I've said, you need stability. You need guys to take steps of progression. You need to have your projected starters stay in the lineup and be the guys that you expect them to be. Um, someone that has had some intrigue since he arrived on campus someone who's gotten some experience under his belt. Again, we're talking about a, a year where players can advance from one level of capability to another. We already mentioned some earlier in this list that are already at a, a very good level and they're looking to break through to that elite level. The guy that I think is is kind of nipping on the heels and ready to break into a, a higher category, that's Isaiah side class. Playing offensive tackle for ASU, it's just going to be critical that he performs at a high level so that this offense can operate as Kenny Dillingham and Bo Baldwin want it to operate. On the contrary, if he does not do his job, or if the offensive line as a whole doesn't do its job, that throws a lot of things into dysfunction. So this is someone that, again, critical, critical, critical 
that his side glass has a very good year. Tempted to put him number one, put him number two, but this is a guy that uh, he has the ability. He's got the chops for it. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it would be a wonderful thing to see him, you know, in that conversation for all conference caliber honors at the end of the season. That'll mean that ASU's offensive line had some stability over the course of the year. I mean, whoever could put class at number one. Hmm. Let's we'll find out. Uh, number two is a guy that Joe talked about also, uh, BJ Green. Cam Scadabo had a great spring. Jalen Conyers had a great spring. Clayton Smith, the uh, transfer from Oklahoma, had, had a great spring. Nobody had a better spring for the Sun Devils than BJ Green. Moving from that defensive tackle spot where he had his first two years, where he was obviously came in as a walk on true freshman and led the team with five sacks in 2021. Last year, tied for the team lead, and it was obviously a tough pass rushing year for the team as a whole. Just two, but two and a half sacks, still good enough for the, the team lead. He had a two and a half sacks by like the first water break of most of these spring practices. This dude put together a monster spring sessions. Uh, and he moved, they moved him to outside and just the pass rushing moves, his, his speed. Now, he's always a little undersized guy, but you know, he's able to use kind of those quickness things like, like kind of the you know, Will Sutton mold. Uh, his first couple years, but he just looked unblockable at times, making life hell for the Sun Devil offense. They're trying to put in together their new scheme, but he was just so good. And he also has that versatility, of course, having played a couple years on the inside, that he could move in and to play one of the defensive tackle spots. And it's something that Brian Ward even talked about, that sometimes that they might roll four edges out there as the, the, the defensive line. But B.J. Green has the ability to be one of those rare double-digit sack type of guys. We haven't seen that. Uh, in ASU at ASU for quite a, quite a while, um, and he has that ability. And I think if you're able to have that very disruptive presence, I mean, if he's game in game out this fall as disruptive as he was during spring, uh, you know, thirty or seventy five percent of what he was in, in spring practice, man, it's going to be something really good. And that's just going to open things up for the rest of the defense. You know, there's a lot of good edge rushers out there. You know, Prince Dorba coming over from Texas. Mentioned Clayton Smith, who had some good moments as well. Uh, and you know, Michael Matus is perhaps you know more in that that run stuff mold as well. But if you can get a guy like BJ Green just humming along at that elite level, I mean, he's put in a lot of hard work. He's a really smart guy. He's the guy studying robotics. He's a robotics engineer. I mean, he's he's an incredibly smart dude, and he's putting those the, you know the the, the the mental side, with the physical side to be in an absolutely disruptive force for the Sun Devil defense. Now, if he can do that on a consistent basis this fall. This Sun Devil defense is not just going to take a couple steps forward. It can take a massive leap forward from what we saw a year ago. So we, we're here. We're at the top of the list. This thing is uh, breezing by. So, you know, I was debating who I wanted for number one. Looking back at it, it's interesting the run game for ASU. You know, I remember a time, the early part of this century, you know, it, it was kind of rare for ASU to have a thousand-yard rusher. You had a few seasons, whether it was kind of by – choice or or a lack of top tier talent or injuries that they would shuffle through depth in a in a particular season at running back uh but man if you look at the last decade with the exception of the COVID season it's only been one year that asu hasn't had a 1000 yard rush and that was 2016 which was kind of a forgettable season uh and that spans across obviously a few coaching staffs a few running backs dj foster demario richard eno benjamin rashad white most recently of course x valade uh we've just seen the running back be such a critical component i'd have to guess that in you know the that period of time, so the majority of the time that we've been doing the show, our season MVP or offensive player of the year has probably been a running back on a handful of occasions. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's Eno, Rashad, just, X just was last year. Me, yeah, You know what I'm saying? So now obviously those are different times, different players, different coaches, uh, different offenses. Uh, you know, as Brad mentioned, that could be something where there's more uh, – depth as far as a running back position is concerned oh yeah if i haven't said who my number one is it's cam cameron scatabo uh, you see what he did at the fcs level at sacramento state very enticing can he do that at this particular level as brad mentioned this dude was just just a ball of fire in the spring and he's got something about him the swagger about him i saw videos recently when they were doing some summer workouts he's power cleaning 375 pounds i lift a lot of weights if i tried to power clean 375 pounds i would break rupture tear hurt every single bone muscle piece of cartilage in my body and all of my soul as well it is a 
quite an achievement for a guy that, you know, we're not talking about a Brandon Jacobs style running back. You know, this guy is just a bowling ball. Someone that I think the fans are really going to get behind as he talked about, he runs with aggression, kind of gives you that little bit of Demario Richard, which is, you know, an all timer in my book. So that's going to be critical. He has the ability to play a very, very important role in this offense. When you have the pass catching threats that ASU has in the established players of Elijah Badger, Jalen Conyers, ones like Guillory and Swinson and Pierre and some of the other receivers that may not be as established but can get the job done. If you've got those guys getting things done, there could be a lot of running room for Scatterbo. He can also catch the ball out of the backfield. Uh, so I think – he is primed for a very intriguing year. Can he get to that thousand yard or more mark? It's certainly on the table for him. And then again, in these circumstances, when we're talking about the, the players that are right at the top of this sort of list of importance, I think about, okay, what happens if they do the things that you expect them to do and hope for them to do? What does that do to your team? You know, he provides stability and versatility for this offense now then if let's just say hypothetically devil's advocate if the leap to the fbs level a little bit much for him if he's not able to perform at the level that he did uh, at sacramento state then that puts you in a position where you have to uh, divide the carries a, a little bit more not that that's necessarily a bad thing but that might take you out of your typical game plan uh, as far as just having more of a platoon as brad talked about Probably going to see a little bit more uh, spreading the love than we saw under Herm Edwards. I don't know if it's possible to do any less. I think guys got maybe a carry uh, before, you know, and, you know, Benjamin Daniel and got five or six hundred or something like that. But uh, Cam Scadabo, between the importance that he has and the intrigue, I'm just really, really, and we've been talking about this pretty much all offseason, really intrigued to see how we look back at this 2023 season for him and and what that's all about. Cause like I said, the, there, there's a very, very high ceiling in what he can do. And if he does that, people are going to be real fired up. This just strikes me as a guy that's got like fan favorite written all over him. Just got to go out and get the job done. My number one previously mentioned by Joe, it's his number two left tackle Isaiah glass. Now, obviously we've talked about a nauseam offensive line remains a major question mark. There's going to be guys, that are new to Tempe, that are coming off of injury, that are make props, becoming a full-time starter for the first time in their collegiate careers. But Glass was holding down that left tackle spot last year. Had some ups, had some downs, as the kind of offense did as a whole. But uh, with so many weapons on this offense for the Sun Devils, and you just need some decent line play to just kind of get to uncork some of those on the opposing defense. You, you got, you know, as we mentioned, you have – a badger you have a gillery you have your tight ends you have a talented group of backs you have a trigger man probably in trenton borgay or even drew pine that have experience at this level but if you can't get anything going if you can't win the battles in the trenches and if you can't keep your quarterback's blind side clear you're going to have a rough go and i think glass has been dialed in a little bit and I, he's had a pretty solid spring but i have i want to see him take that next step up and i think he has the ability to do so uh, he's going to be out there, you know, getting those one those reps with the ones. Now, now one thing to 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 monitor. I mean, obviously, ASU brought in Bram Walden, the former four star offensive lineman, a local guy, went up to Oregon. Now he's back in Tempe. Uh, he was Brent Walden was dinged up a little bit in spring, so didn't get as as many reps as he would have hoped. But perhaps that you know a, a young guy kind of nipping on his heels a little bit might help. You know, the iron sharpens iron with class in terms of being able to take that next step and become a good Pac-12, perhaps an all-conference caliber uh, left tackle. This, just There's so many weapons on this offense, and we saw so many different wrinkles. And with Bo Baldwin's experience calling very effective offenses, what Kenny Dillingham has already put on his young career's resume, very tantalizing. But you need to win at the point of attack. You need a decent offensive line at minimum. And uh, ASU had some big-time struggles in that area uh, a season ago. But I think – uh, and you add in the local element there, uh, Glass from Queen Creek. This whole thing is about activating the Valley. He's, you know, very active on social media, very positive, putting, trying to rally folks around. So if you can have a, an, a like hometown guy on your left tackle, perhaps you a homegrown, you know, Grant Morana, it was in the state, you know, yeah, in, in, in that Tucson. Yeah. It's see, Tucson. as they're very, you know, they'll, they'll make that uh, point of uh, clarification. Um, yeah. Borgay, you know, home, homegrown quarterback, you know, other homegrown pieces as well. That just fits overall narrative and a lot of, you know, if you can 
get all those elements coming together. You get good offensive play. You get good offensive play from local guys. Man, that that's like the Kenny Dillingham like dream right there. So I think you know all eyes are, are going to be on us. Isaiah Glass, lock down that left side, young man. Let this offense flourish. And I think that they have the weapons in their arsenal to do some damage in the pack this year. All right. So before we uh, kind of close out and talk to uh, Plas Johnson, the uh, most recent commit from Chaparral High School for the Sun Devils, let's do kind of a, a quick review of our top 10 lists. I'll start it off just kind of going down 1 to 10 this time. Number one on the list, left tackle, Isaiah Glass. Then edge, BJ Green. Tight end, Jalen Conyers. Uh, three tech, Anthony Cooper. Running back, Scam Ca- or Cam Scatabo is my number five. Scam Catabo. Is that like, <laughs> that's his bizarro version that's got like a, you know, mustache or something like that? Okay. He's got some mar- multi-level marketing opportunities he wants to discuss with you. <laughs> um, I don't even know what to say of that. <laughs> Uh, number six, uh, wide receiver Xavier Guillory knows uh, tackle Deshaun Mallory is my number seven. Center Lee Fatano at number eight. Linebacker Trey Brown, nine. And rounding out my list at number 10, cornerback Roe Torrance. I'm going to start mine with some enunciation of Cam Scadabo. <laughs> number one for me, running back. Number two, offensive lineman Isai Glass. Number three, defensive lineman BJ Green. Number four, Tight end Jalen Conyers, number five, kicker Dario Longhetto, number six, wide receiver Elijah Badger, seven, defensive back Roe Torrance, eight, offensive lineman Lee Fautanu, nine, defensive lineman Anthony Cooper, and number 10, defensive back Chris Edmonds. All right, so those are our lists. We'd like to hear from you folks out there. Who do you think are going to be the most crucial non quarterback Sun Devils for this upcoming year? You can hit us up on social media. Throw out our list. Tell us why we're very smart and correct in our order or why we're very bad and don't know what we're talking about because your lists are reign supreme. In any event, uh, right now we're going to be talking to a conversation I had with uh, the three-star athlete commit out of Chaparral High School, a local guy joining the ranks of ASU's 2024 class, Class Johnson. All right, so let's start off with the big question. Obviously, a number of schools were vying for you and uh, has the place to continue your football career. But ultimately, why was ASU the right fit for you? Um, I just really believe the coaches, what, with how they're going to develop me as a person and an athlete. Uh, I just really like the people there, the community of it. You uh, had uh, recently uh, taken an official visit to uh, ASU in Tempe, and gotten to know the Sun Devil football program up close. You know, on that visit, what were some of the things that really kind of jumped out to you the most that really impressed you? Uh, once I really got to see like the coaches' work ethic and how they like talk to each other and uh, how close everyone really is, rather than like you know just it being for a job, but they're actually like really a family though. Yeah, obviously a big part of that is obviously is Kenny Dillingham, your uh, your future head coach, and you know you guys obviously have the connection of just kind of both being uh, chaparral guys. You know, what were some of the things that kind of jumped out about? Kenny Dillingham, um, you know, as a head coach and as a uh, the program that he's trying to to shape and mold. He's a really he's a really cool guy. When it's time to like you know I like lock in and stuff, he he knows how to do that. Um, he's a really easy like head coach to talk to. He, he he seems like a great head coach and someone I could trust with my career going further. How cool is it that you guys, you know, obviously have that, that Chaparral connection, just kind of, you know, and both being local Arizona guys? Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's like a little bonus. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you know, one of the guys that was uh, very critical in your recruitment, uh, in your future position coach, Brian Carrington, developed a reputation as one of the best recruiters in the nation. What were some of the things that really jumped out to you about what makes him an effective recruiter and also, you know, as a guy that you want to play for? Oh, he's a completely truthful dude. Everything he tries to tell you, he tries to back it up to make sure that, like, you know, he's telling the truth. Uh, especially when I got, like, time alone with them. And then it really seemed like he knew what he was doing outside of just recruiting. Uh, he knows what to do with corners and how to develop them. And I trust him because he's been at over, like, at over mostly all the levels. So he's something that somebody I could trust really. Since got since getting in Tempe, uh, Kenny Dillingham's really trying to you know put a, a renewed focus uh, on you know the local football talent here. A lot of the local players that you know kind of might have been overlooked by ASU in prior years. How do you, you know as one of the top local players? How do you think that this new staff and culture at ASU is this kind of new era of Sun Devil football is being viewed by 
you know, kind of local players as a whole? I think it would be better than before with recruiting. And I trust the other coaches with the recruiting too because uh, they're not they're not really into the three, four, or five stars a whole lot. They're really just into like, you know, like if the athlete's like has the same abilities and same stuff as a four or five star, but it could only be a two star, three star, like unranked. You know, obviously, you know, as a local guy, you know, um, that proverbial title of the hometown hero, you know, you've seen guys over the years like DJ Foster, Nikhil Harry, uh, Chase Lucas, for example, you know, it's kind of, you know, be, uh, continue to stay home, play for ASU uh, and develop, you know, into a, a beloved star. How much appeal does that, you know, kind of, you know, that quote unquote hometown hero um, potential hold for you? Being a hometown hero or like, you know, staying AZ wasn't a whole big deal to me. Um, I didn't really let that, like, choose or decide where I went, but I don't know, it's just definitely something, you know, like, I have, like, you know, I, I might have to, like, I probably do have to carry, you know, the name and, uh, you know, start getting busy, so. Is it cool for you, though, that, uh, you know, you get to stay home and your friends and family, you know, can stay in town and, and, and watch a ball out as a Sun Devil? Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, you're a guy that has had great success, you know, playing both sides of the ball so far in high school, you know, coming off a, a monster thousand yard receiving season. Uh, give our listeners, you know, a scouting report on what skills and what you bring to the field, both on offense and perhaps on your in your future home on the defensive side of the ball. For receiver, um, I think it kind of carries over to defense, like, pretty well. But, uh, like, offense is, like, catching the ball, you know, like, route running. And then it kind of bring comes over to defense where I get ball hogging skills, and then on top of that, you know, I'm able to stay on my guy. Um, I'm able to cheat routes, and use my hands, but I'm still learning my technique, still learning everything. So, yeah, as you mentioned, of course, you know, most of your your time has been seemingly spent on the offensive side of the ball, but switch, making that uh, that switch over to defense. Uh, you know, what what's some of the what's some of the uh, the skills and things that you think that you have in your your skill set that fit well for the defensive back positions? Um, definitely the ball hogging skills, um, the route combinations, jumping routes, but, um, good low amount stuff, helpful stuff. What are you most looking forward to about down the road becoming a Sun Devil, running out through Tillman Tunnel and that maroon and gold? Just really getting to be able to play and, uh, uh, you know, I, I finally actually, well, since I was like a little kid, you know, you see it like kids, like the players coming out the tunnel and stuff, and I used to be in the stadium. So it's kind of like a cool thing to think about. But then once I finally, you know, get out the tunnel, it's going to be reps. You know, obviously one more one more season of high school ball ahead before you get to, to run out there through Tillman Tunnel. So when you look ahead for this, you know, upcoming season, you know, what are some of your goals for your senior season? Sure, I'm trying to hit 2,000 yards this year <laughs> for receiver for sure. Um, but, you know, the usual, you know, play good. But for me, I'd probably say, like, hopefully try to get some interceptions this year. I was messing around last year. So <laughs> we got to see offense. Probably just try to, you know, like work on catching the ball more probably and stuff. And that's going to do it for this episode of Speak of the Devils. I'd like to thank our guest. Michael Butter, Tollefson, and Plass Johnson. This is going to be a very active time. Now, Joe, we are going to be back in on the weekly shows because, you know, this is kicking off season 13. You, we're going to be heating your feeds each and every week, I believe, you know, through January. Um, I think this is our, when we, next time we get to take a week off because, yeah, the camp's going to be starting up here pretty soon. We'll be ramping up with some great guests to get you ready for the upcoming season as well. Uh, and then all camp will be here. The season will be here. Then signing day will be here. The portal opens. It's just mad. There's no breaks uh, for us here. And it's 2024 season. We might as well just start previewing that now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hoops, bat, uh, baseball is going to, uh, there's no rest for the weary. There are a lot of sports. Lots of sports. Uh, so, but in the meantime, you can stay with us on the social media side of things. Because again, we've got some, we made one big announcement early on. One more to go. That will be coming here pretty soon. It's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. That though will be excited to share with you all. So make sure you lock, stay locked in on uh, social media at Twitter, S O T D podcast on Instagram and threads at speak. Threading it up, baby. Let's go. 
Yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure out what the hell the point of that app is because, like, the, the Twitter also. I got like 300 followers, dude. You know, like, I'm feeling all right about it. So <laughs> we're there. So, yeah, at Speak of the Devils on Instagram and uh, and threads, facebook.com slash SOTD podcast, and give me a follow on Twitter, Instagram, threads, whatever, on B at B Denny 29. Yeah, you can find me on MySpace. I think uh, I got the Seize the Day by Avenged Sevenfold is my background song. Some real solid coding in there. I think you guys are going to like it. Get pretty fired is, up about it. Is Tom getting in on the uh, cage match between Elon and Zach? That would be a perfect run in. You know, just come saying? in with steel chair. Just... I saw like a, a, like a meme about it <laughs> with Tom flying off the top rope. So, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, you can follow me on all the things. Uh, here i'm trying to like look at the camera and where the graphics oh, are yeah, it's right there this is i'm looking at a tv there. and trying to point at this graphic i do not feel like i'm doing a very good job uh joe healy yeah it's it's yeah. really not as easy as you would think uh, hi joe healy 42 is what i am on social media and while you're following and patronizing things how about our sponsors of course DeFalco's Deli, 2334 North Scottsdale Road. Go ahead and eat meals of food every single day of your life. Cactus Sports, you got to gear up. Get on down to Mill Avenue. Check out the store location. Get on to cactussports.com. The season is creeping up. You can't be showing up to year one of the Kenny Dillingham era wearing your old Herm Edwards era gear. That's just, you know, I'm a big fashion guy. Fashion is my passion. So, <laughs> You need to be looking right. So get on down to Cactus Sports so you can do just that. Devilsdigest.com. Of course, you got to support all the great content that all the good folks, someone including me, put out on Devil's Digest. Fall camp is right around the corner. And I'm telling you, if there's any time to be locked in, you got to be locked in now in the coming weeks because you're going to start to get a flood of content about the Sun Devil football for 2023. No better place to get that. And Devil's Digest, of course, part of the Rivals.com network, a subscription there. Gets you access to a lot of stuff for recruiting, coverage. You're going to love it if you're not already there. Huge shout out to our wonderful friends at Jones Auto Group. They have hooked up some friends of mine. Great experiences. I mean, I'm not just going to refer someone that's close in my life to a company or a, a salesperson just for the heck of it. Uh, our guy Parker Jones, Jones Auto Group, they treat people incredibly they do that for everybody, but if you're a member of the Sun Devil community, like I'm sure that all of you are who are listening and watching, you might get a little extra something, you know what I'm saying? So check out Jones Auto Group. They're doing some incredible things, as uh, you've probably seen, helping out to support Sun Devil Athletics and the Sun Devil student athletes when we're talking about the NIL side of things. Uh, can't say enough good things about them. Also, a lot of great things to say about Spaghetti Shack, the expansion. Got to check out the new store location. That's on the top of the list of things that'll be done at some point in the near future. I can guarantee you that. Great stuff. Going to get you some spaghetti. I see that they're. I still need to try. They got like the pizza bread. The spaghetti deal. tacos are great. That's. I, I just need to run through the gamut. I usually just go big old pile of spaghetti, ton of meatballs. But I'm gonna I'm gonna diversify here. You can hold me to that. Uh, and then of course. Last but certainly not least, our wonderful friends at Sun Devil Family Charities. You can catch them online at sundevilfamily.org. Also, as part of the uh, live show that we're going to be doing at the Graduate Hotel there in Tempe, we're going to put together some ideas to help support Sun Devil Family Charities. So that's going to be a component of what we do. So in addition to coming out, seeing the show, hanging out with us, getting a little weird, summoning it up a little bit, there might be an opportunity to support a very good cause. And that's a balance, right? You can act like a little bit of a degenerate, Give a little money to a good cause. That's a Your good conscience day. is clear. Conscience is clear. So that'll be a good day. As always, huge thank you to our wonderful sponsors. Yes, definitely. So when you're done supporting all of those wonderful folks, make sure you drop us a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. Joe and I will be back for our annual national and Pac-12 preview where we put some predictions out there on the record. And we'll be joined by ESPN anchor, and Sun Devil alum, Matt Berry.